Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. Here I'll outline some of the key terms of Marx's labor theory of value and the theory of surplus value. A use value is something that is self-evidently useful to human beings, anything that can be used to the benefit of someone. But in classical economic theory, a useful thing becomes a commodity when it can be exchanged for a certain quantity of another useful thing, that is, another commodity. How does something become a commodity? Only by the application of labor power to improve or alter an existing useful thing. Consider this example. Imagine a community living in an isolated desert area in which there is a spring that provides water. The water is useful and necessary to the people, but it is not yet a commodity because it cannot be exchanged. Anyone can go to the spring and get water anytime he or she wishes to. Now imagine that a particular individual organizes several other individuals to join with him and they set up an armed guard around the spring and they prevent anyone else in a community from having access to the spring. The act of organizing and posting an armed guard represents an addition of labor to the useful thing, the water, that turns the water into a commodity. Or in a more positive example, imagine that in the same scenario the spring dries up during the hottest month of the summer. But someone gets the idea that by digging a cistern they can store some water from the spring that will carry them through the summer. The stored water becomes a commodity with exchange value not just because of the scarcity of water during the hot month of the summer, but also because of the labor expended either to limit access to the water or to make water available during the summer drought. An account such as this of the labor theory of value might more typically focus on an example where value is added through labor to raw materials. For example, one might consider certain quantities of raw materials or processed materials, such as wheat ground into flour, some yeast, other ingredients, all of which would have a certain value which would be increased significantly if a baker combined those materials and baked them into a loaf of bread. But in the previous example, I have deliberately chosen a scenario in which scarcity, supply, and demand play a prominent role in order to illustrate that even when supply and demand might seem to be determining the price of a commodity, it is labor that will play the decisive role in determining the commodity's value. Market-oriented theories of value will assert that supply and demand determines the price of a commodity. But Marx rejected this kind of an argument. Marx argued that over time, and in larger economies, commodities will always gravitate toward their real values. That is, the value determined by the amount of labor expended in order to prepare the commodity for exchange. Marx also drew a distinction between labor and labor power. Labor, for Marx, refers to the socially necessary labor required to transform a commodity into a form that can be exchanged. Socially necessary labor is the quantity of labor required by the average, skilled, competent worker to perform a particular task. This understanding of labor as socially necessary labor makes it possible to conceptualize labor as a commodity in its own right, a commodity that can be exchanged against other commodities. If it were not for this concept of socially necessary labor, then it would seem that a product produced by a worker who was lazy or unskilled and took longer to produce the product would reasonably cost more than the same product made by a skilled energetic worker. If the owner of capital, that is, the controller of the means of production, paid the worker directly for labor, exploitation would not be possible. The market would drive the price of labor to the level necessary 
for the reproduction of labor, that is, the sustenance of the worker's life, and so on. Instead, the capitalist pays the worker for his or her laboring power for a set period of time that is longer than the time needed to work in order to reproduce the worker's conditions of production. This general confusion of laboring power for labor is, Marx argues, the sole source of surplus value or profit. Because of the confusion between labor and labor power, the capitalist always receives more labor than he exchanges for the labor with another commodity. So, Marx argues, if someone exchanges a ton of wheat for an ounce of gold, these two commodities will have relatively equal value in terms of the quantity of labor that has been required to produce each of them. But both the wheat and the gold will have been produced under conditions that required the worker to work longer than the quantity of socially necessary labor that would have been required to produce the wheat or the gold, and longer than the period for which they have truly been paid. Hence, both the wheat and the gold will have more crystallized labor embedded in them than will have been paid for by the owners of the commodities. This is not a situation in which one capitalist will make a profit at the other's expense. Both the wheat merchant and the gold merchant will make a profit at the expense of the workers. For labor to function as a full-fledged commodity requires certain historical conditions characteristic of modernity. For example, a general acceptance of the rule of law and an understanding of the individual as a citizen who freely gives his or her allegiance to a nation-state, rather than the feudal understanding of the individual as fixed in one's subject position within an aristocratic hierarchy by circumstances of birth. Duncan Foley describes these historically necessary conditions very succinctly in his entry on labor from the Dictionary of Marxist Thought. Foley writes, the historical precondition for the appearance of labor power on the market for capitalists to buy is the emergence of a class of free laborers. Free first in the sense that they have the legal right to dispose of their labor power for limited periods in exchange negotiations with potential buyers, and free as well from the ownership of or access to their own means of production. Now here's how Marx describes this condition in Chapter 6 of Capital, Volume 1. Labor power can appear upon the market as a commodity only if, and so far as, its possessor, the individual whose labor power it is, offers it for sale, or sells it, as a commodity. In order that he may be able to do this, he must have it at his disposal, must be the untrammeled owner of his capacity for labor, i.e., of his person. He and the owner of money meet in the market and deal with each other as on the basis of equal rights. With this difference alone, that one is buyer, the other seller, both, therefore, equal in the eyes of the law. The continuance of this relation demands that the owner of labor power should sell it only for a definite period. For if he were to sell it rump and stump once for all, he would be selling himself, converting himself from a free man into a slave, from an owner of a commodity into a commodity. And the second essential condition to the owner of money finding labor power in the market as a commodity is this, that the laborer, instead of being in the position to sell commodities in which his labor is incorporated, must be obliged to offer for sale as a commodity that very labor power which exists only in his living self. Marx's conception of labor, labor power, surplus labor, and surplus value produced a revolutionary understanding of the commodity form as well. I will discuss Marx's analysis of the commodity form and commodity fetishism in another webcast. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But if you have questions or comments as you're reading about and thinking about this topic, send me an email.